When Steve Callahan's boat sinks in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, he's stranded in a tiny life raft thousands of miles from land. You're gonna die all alone in the middle of the ocean. I've no hope anymore. For an incredible 76 days, he battles the sea. Whether the shark eats me or not, I'm done. Extreme hunger. Your body starts eating its own muscle. And his own mind. Psychologically, mentally, I was just done. In an epic fight to stay alive. I just felt like I was totally doomed. Twenty-nine-year-old Bostonian Steve Callahan is halfway through the sailing trip of a lifetime. I remember the first time I went out sailing. I love the immediacy of it. You can go off and have an adventure. He's already sailed from the USA to the Canary Islands and is now heading off on a three and a half thousand mile return leg back across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. Testing. I figured on the very outside, it would be a month to get to the Caribbean, but I'd probably make it in a few weeks. For Steve, the trip is an adventure and also a means of escape. My life was in a bit of a shambles. My marriage had gone south and we had split up. There I was, ready for a new stage of my life. Steve is hoping that isolation on the open seas in his self-built boat will help him leave a difficult year behind. I was really on my own out there, which was fine. I didn't need people. I didn't really need the society so much. I pictured myself more as like a sea creature. In Steve's first week at sea, weather conditions could hardly be better. When I left the Canary Islands for a week, I had just the most idyllic sail. Everything was just beautiful, and I'd listen to my radio and play the boat like a drum, do my exercise. I had this whole exercise routine on the boat. It just felt completely at home there. But 800 miles and one week out into the mid-Atlantic, the weather begins to change. The weather just started turning dirty. It was probably blowing 35 or so knots. And the waves started growing. For an experienced sailor like Steve, it's nothing out of the ordinary. I'd seen a lot worse weather before. And so I figured, well, it'll probably be a day or two when this is scoot by. I wasn't worried. Everything was fine. As night falls, and the rough weather continues, Steve switches on the autopilot and beds down for the night. People think that sailing is a very quiet undertaking. It's not.
big waves are slamming against the side of the boat. You get this quite jerky motion, but I was still able to kind of lie down, and I was kind of half asleep. All of a sudden, there was this, this big bang on the side of the boat. There was just this huge flood of water immediately. Steve has no idea what he's hit, but the boat's hull has been torn apart. The water was rising very, very quickly. Within seconds, the water is above his head. I just thought, this boat is going to be underwater. I'm, I'm going right to the bottom. Steve's boat is sinking. He knows he has seconds to get to the life raft up on deck. So I yank on the line, and the line keeps coming out. No, nothing, 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 nothing. This didn't work at all. Finally, boom, it pops open. Steve makes it to safety. But just as he's about to cut himself loose, a terrifying thought hits him. With the equipment that's in the raft, I will not last very long at all. Everything he needs to have any chance of survival is stowed deep inside the flooded boat. It was essential that I go back on the boat and dive down and get equipment. Even though I realized that you know, the boat could slip under the waves at any moment. Against every instinct, he knows he has no option but to dive back down into the sinking boat. It was all dark in there, so I couldn't really see anything. I could feel the ditch kit. It was tied down, and I started cutting away. Steve frees his emergency supply kit. But just as he makes it to the exit hatch, slammed closed. The, the boat's covered with water. I'm going down. I thought that was it. If I don't get out of here right now, I am going to die. There's a 100% certainty of that. But just as Steve's lungs are about to burst, a huge wave breaks across the boat. All of a sudden, there's air. It was a huge, huge relief. With only seconds to spare, Steve escapes, clutching his vital emergency supplies. I jumped into the raft, and I saw that I was drifting away from the boat. Steve can only watch as he drifts away from not just his boat, but also his dream. I went drifting off into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It just was kind of devastating. That 
first night, it blew hard, really cold and really wet and really scary. I was shivering a lot and I was worried about dying of hypothermia. I might not make it till the morning. Dawn breaks to reveal the true horror of Steve's situation. His boat is gone, and he is alone in the middle of the Atlantic. I'm a long way away from anybody, and I'm in a very empty part of the ocean as well. I am just this teeny, teeny little thing, surrounded by this immensity of sea. It was kind of overpowering. Steve has no means of communication and knows that no one will be looking for him. I told people at home, I gave them five or six weeks after I left the Canary Islands as being, you know, don't worry about me if I don't show up this time. Steve calculates he's a thousand miles from land and completely at the mercy of wind and currents as they push him further westwards, out into the ocean. I was in a place where there was basically no shipping and I really needed to get to the shipping lanes to have any chance of being picked up at all. Steve estimates that the shipping lanes are 350 miles further west. But even if the winds still push him in the same direction, it will take him at least two weeks to get there and he only has a tiny supply of emergency drinking water. I was worried I had eight pints of water, which theoretically was good enough for maybe eight days. Without enough water, he has almost no chance of making the shipping lanes alive. It's a great irony that the world's biggest desert actually is the ocean. You can't drink any of the water there. There's no shade, and my chances of survival were almost hopeless. Along with a harpoon and a few other supplies he rescued from his boat, Steve discovers three emergency water purification kits, known as solar stills. The solar stills that I had were created during the Second World War for downed pilots. I never knew anybody who'd actually used them before. I've got eight pints of water. It's over two weeks before I reach the shipping lane. So the solar stills were absolutely critical to, to any long-term survival. Steve fills the still with seawater, knowing that the heat of the sun should separate the salt from the water. I'd have, oh, half hour, I've got a whole bag of water. I kept trying them again and again and again. Steve cannot figure out how the solar stills work. It's seawater, it was just seawater. It just didn't work at all. And now he faces his first full night adrift in the ocean. I was desperately lonesome and there was no part of this that was not kind of a, a hellish experience. Steve knows that it's essential he solves his drinking water problem and the storm gives him an idea. I knew that most survivors had relied on collecting rainwater. If Steve can use the raft's canopy to collect rainwater, he may have hit upon an answer. pretty much like drinking somebody's vomit. It was just so awful, it was undrinkable. The orange pigment from the canopy contaminates the water. I decided not, I'm never gonna drink the water off the canopy. It was just too dangerous.
Steve's quest to find solace out at sea has resulted in horrific isolation. And he can see no way out of his ordeal. I wrote my own epitaph that day. My name is Stephen Callahan. I was shipwrecked at approximately this position. I am drifting in a six-man raft. I'm doomed. I really, I just felt like I was totally doomed. The currents are pushing Steve westwards, towards the shipping lanes, his only chance of rescue. But he's over two weeks away, with only enough water to last him a few days. It wasn't going to keep me alive very long. You know, I'm taking a little sip every now and then, hardly even swallowing it, really. It's just being more absorbed. I'm getting really thirsty. Steve ekes out his supplies for a whole week, but knows his only hope are the solar stills. But first he must understand what he's doing wrong. It was critical to figure out how to use these things. Just like go back just from square one and try to figure out how does this thing actually work. It's a drastic step, but he decides to rip one of his three precious stills apart in the hope that he can work out how to make them produce fresh water. All right. And I finally dawned on me. It had to be inflated just the right amount. solar still to produce, I'm talking a spoonful of fresh water was like the hugest high I could possibly have. Steve now has a tiny supply of water, but after seven days at sea, he faces yet another problem. He's run out of food. I was really hungry, just like really struck me how desperate I had become. There's no way I'm going to live out here. But just as Steve is beginning to think that the ocean is bereft of life, immediately my heart kind of jumped in my throat. There are fish here. I knew right away that if I'm fishing with a spear in an inflated raft, I'm taking a big chance here. I kept trying and nothing would work. I just couldn't spear one. It was very frustrating. Steve spends the whole day trying to catch fish. But just as he thinks he may finally succeed, the firing mechanism on his spear gun breaks. Now, I don't have a range of six feet, possibly. I have a range of about 18 inches. I 
always really hungry. It just really struck me how desperate I had become at that point. For days, Steve continues to try and catch fish, but to no avail. In the physical sense, it was incredibly depressing. In terms of what I'd felt like I had done with my life, it was depressing. It was the most hellish time in my life. All Steve's attempts to catch fish have failed. But if he gives up, he'll die of starvation. I knew that this was not going to be easy. The fish has got to be right under the spear tip. By day 14, I've caught my first fish and I've produced water. So now, as long as the raft stays in one piece and I keep my act together, I might be able to live out here indefinitely. For the first time in 14 days, Steve has a sense of hope. But the vast and deadly ocean is not about to let him rest. All of a sudden, flop, 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 against the bottom of the raft in the middle of the night. It was like, what's going on? Boom! The whole raft lifted up, you know, just punched off the surface of the, of the ocean. Whoa, what the hell was that? A massive shark is attacking Steve's life raft. It was gonna rip apart the raft and then I'd be left in the water and forget it. Whether the shark eats me or not, I'm done. I was so freaked out about it, I thought for sure that was gonna be it. If I was being attacked, this thing was really whacking away at the raft. Finally hit it a few times with a spear and then it, it went away. There's a ship right there on the horizon right in front of me. And I thought, ah, this is it. After 15 days lost at sea, Steve has finally drifted into the shipping lanes. Come in here! Yeah, come in here! In this perfect conditions, you know, it's fairly calm out, completely black night, perfect for flares. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it looks like the ship's coming for me. It keeps steaming towards me and steaming towards me and... I was convinced that it had seen me. And it was close enough I could smell the diesel in the air. To Steve's utter elation, rescue has come at last. Cheers! Yeah! 
and then just goes right by me. I'm sitting there rocking and it's wake after it went by. I was most disappointed in myself because I knew that that was probably gonna be the case with the ship. It's really, really hard to see something at sea, even if you know it's there and you're looking for it. So if you're not looking for it, it's really hard to be seen. Steve is once again left alone in the ocean. But at least now, he has the real hope of being spotted by passing ships. All the way around the clock, I would just give a really careful look all the way around the horizon. Every morning was a bit of hope, and then every afternoon was like the depths of fatigue and despair. Over the next 10 days, Steve spots only a handful of ships. They all sail by. I've seen ships, I've signaled them, nobody stops and picks me up. Steve slowly begins to realize that the shipping lanes are just as empty as the rest of the ocean. Having that whole fantasy blown to hell basically was the definitively the hugest down. After a month at sea, Steve has drifted right through the shipping lanes, unnoticed. And back home, nobody even knows he's missing. So pulled with emotions. That was the first time I cried. And it was like, this is the state of my life. What are you doing out here? My life just seemed completely and utterly as open and empty as the, the ocean. Steve has drifted an epic 700 miles but now faces a devastating new reality. His next chance of rescue won't come until he reaches the Caribbean, another thousand miles away. At first, I never thought I'd even reach the shipping lanes. So thinking about getting all the way to the islands, which was, you know, way beyond the shipping lanes, was not even conceivable to me. But if Steve is going to survive, he knows there's no time for self-pity. I was discovering I was all way more resilient than I ever thought I could be. I'm on my own, nobody's gonna pick me up. I've gotta reach the islands now. Count on yourself, count on keeping your boat together and keep your act together and continuing your voyage. Steve is still averaging 25 miles a day. But checking his charts again, a terrible thought dawns on him. If he drifts any further north, he'll miss the Caribbean completely and be swept back into the mid-Atlantic. I would have been in a voyage of indeterminate length, years possibly. It'd be a total disaster. But conditions aboard the raft are also placing Steve's survival in serious doubt. The environment was just incredibly horrible. I could never stretch out straight in the raft, so I'd lie down kind of curled on my side, getting cramps in my legs, so I could sleep about an hour at a time. I started developing all these little saltwater sores. 
and you're sitting in a salt and crested environment, so you're having literally salt rubbed into the wounds 24-7. Steve now drifts into tropical waters, and it's getting hotter. His body is desperate for more water than the two remaining solar stills can produce. The dehydration is just agonizing. Dying to get a drop where, you know, I'm looking at the solar still and watching these drops come down in a spoonful of water. You know, if somebody come along and said, well, you got a choice, you can have this cup of water, in, but we have to take your hand for it, which do you want? I'd probably, honestly, I'd probably say, take the hand. Steve is also increasingly ravaged with hunger. I was starving all the time. And your body starts eating its own muscle. As a result, I was getting skinnier and more desperate. There's just this, this great emptiness that can never be filled up. Speared the Storado. But just as he thinks he's landed a fish. It went right through it, and the Dorado just busted the end of the spear off. And the Dorado just rolled over and ran along the bottom tubes. It was just like one of these, oh my god, moments. There was a horrible sound, and it was just like all these bubbles coming out. The thing just deflated really, really quickly. The impaled fish has punctured the life raft. Steve is now sinking into the ocean. And I knew I was in serious, serious trouble. Pretty short order. The whole bottom tube was completely deflated. It ripped a hole about that long in the tube. I thought that I could go indefinitely as long as the raft was in one piece, and now the raft isn't in one piece anymore. Maybe this is going to be the end of the line. With the crucial bottom ring of his raft damaged, it is now too unstable for Steve to fish or collect water. It was like I was walking in rubber quicksand. Plus, it's not really drifting very fast with the wind. So I'm not going to make it if I don't find a solution. I kept getting a repair on there. I wound stuff around it really tight, and I'd pump it up. I kept doing it again and again and again for days. Please. Oh. It was really very depressing because I, I just didn't think that I could fix it. Steve knows the punctured raft is a disaster. He's going slower, wasting precious calories pumping it up, and now faces an even bigger problem. I started consuming both water and the fish that was hanging to dry. I was unable to renew that stock while the bottom was deflated. I imagine it wouldn't have been a whole lot longer before I would have died. For 10 days, Steve exhausts himself trying to keep the raft inflated, but fails. 
After battling to stay alive for so long, it's the final straw. I was absolutely beat. That was it. I gave up. I, I just laid down. I was like, I just totally broke down. You're going to die all alone in the middle of the ocean. You've never done anything successful in your life. I only had failed marriage, failed relationships. I'd never really given enough of myself to anybody. I just wasted a life. Starving, thirsty, and without hope, Steve feels that death is now a certainty. And then I got scared. This is very real, and you're going to be dead in a matter of hours if you don't snap out of it and get yourself together. In a final act of desperation, Steve searches for anything that might save his life. And it just, something happened, and it just clicked. And I go, oh, yeah, the fork. Steve hopes that a fork might just be strong enough to secure a patch to the raft. around and jump for joy or anything, but that was just like the, the hugest victory of my life. But Steve's elation is short-lived. His supplies have virtually vanished. He's still hundreds of miles from land, and his body is desperately weak. Well, yeah, I got out of that, but now what? I'm still doomed. There's a day off your life. There's another day off your life. I just, I really didn't think I was going to make it. It really was a period of just hanging on. Oh my God, this is such marginal life. Looking at my watch and thinking that minutes had passed, looking at it again and it being like 30 seconds had passed. It was like, it just seemed to drag on a really long time. After 66 days alone, Steve's final lifeline is gone. His solar stills have reached the end of their working life. The cloth on the bottom is rotted out. It's going to be totally useless. There's no way to repair it. His only means of producing drinking water is now gone. I just figured, this really is it. You know, I have no hope anymore. It was ending. Steve now only has three cans of emergency water left, and his body's toxic salt levels are pushing his sanity to the limits. The physical part of me is going, hey, there's water over there. Let's go snag that. But there was that overbearing rational part of me that was going, no, 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 no. I don't care. Unless, you know, you are dying. You are, you're, you're not getting into that right yet. It 
this is a, a view of heaven from a seat in hell. Alone on the ocean for over 70 days, Steve's body and mind are now shutting down. His only hope is to reach land. I expected to see the islands like days and days before now. In the islands, I should be reaching out. I should be seeing some sign of reaching the islands. But then Steve has a shocking realization. If he's miscalculated his position, currents will sweep him back into mid ocean and certain doom. Maybe I'm way north of the islands, next stop England, you know, eight months from now. So that, that was tough. I was very worried that I had screwed up and I wasn't gonna make it. I, I just don't know anymore. Dead. I've never been dead before. Maybe this is what it's like, and this is what I deserve for my shabby life, and maybe I'm just gonna be floating around out here forever. I felt all the hopelessness of people who'd been adrift at sea before and never came back, and nobody ever knew what happened to them. And here I was amongst them, and I could kind of feel them all around me. It just was a horribly desperate feeling. It was over. I was just done. I, I had no more, no more to give. All of a sudden, it was like all kinds of crates and bottles and plastic. To me, that was the first definitive sign that I was coming into changes. I'm gonna see something. sun rose, it was like, pfft, there's an island in front of me. I, I couldn't have been more than 10 miles out. To see the green of the island was like, ah, oh, such a, it was intense. horror. 
Steve realizes that the island is an impregnable fortress of vertical cliffs and razor-sharp coral reefs. Oh my god. I've come all this way, and there's no way I can make a landing. After enduring so much for so long, Steve can't let salvation slip away from him at the final hurdle. This voyage is ending today. No question about it. One way or the other, this is, this is going to come to an end. Somebody's actually, I couldn't believe somebody was actually out there. On the morning of his 76th day adrift, Steve is spotted by some local fishermen. He said something to the effect of like, what you doing out here, Mon? You know, <laughs> it's like, well, I'm not out here, you know, improving my suntan. senses were like plugged into an electric circuit somehow. They were all amplified so that every color was like really, really vibrant and every smell was really, really intense. It just was like heart-wrenching. It was so beautiful to me. Having endured 76 days in his tiny raft, Steve's leg muscles have atrophied and he weighs just 100 pounds. After six weeks in the hospital, Steve is reunited with the parents he thought he'd never see again. The small island of Marie Galant, where he's found, is just 60 miles south of his original destination, Antigua. There's nothing noble in me having survived. It's just what I did. I had too much unfinished business, and I think that kept me alive to a large degree. 